Hello everyone, my name is Shelby and this is the series where I reveal what is inside these mystery pottery molds I found on Gumtree. Hello and welcome to Mold 43. I'm really excited for this mold because I didn't actually pick it. You picked it on my Instagram stories. So if you have Instagram and don't follow me over there, make sure to go check that out because sometimes in the stories we pick molds out together and it's a really fun time. Next week is also a story pick from Instagram as well. Anyway, pouring this one up, I can see the dimension of this one so I could kind of tell what it is. But I pour the clay in, let it set, I pull away the excess, take the rubber band off to open it up to reveal a dainty little plate. It is really, really gorgeous. So I trim off that little bit of excess so that it will sit nice and flat on the table. And then I flip it over to reveal that it's actually not just a plate. It's a gorgeous little saucer. So I, you'll see, I'm, I'm talking ahead of the, the video. Uh, but <laughs> it's a gorgeous little saucer, 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 um, a saucer. And it is so dainty, but I don't have a teacup yet. So this one was made in 1977 by Duncan Ceramics. It is really beautiful it was quite dirty it had a little bit of old rubber band in there so that's why I always open them up first to clean them I know it ruins the surprise for me a little bit but that's fine I do this for you anyway I match up the mold put the rubber band back in and that's just for you to see what the mold is in case you look at getting it for your own collection or creating it for yourself now I don't have a teacup I'm hoping that there's a teacup in the reveals, um, but for now, we're just gonna have to make do with this. At the moment, I only have the sort of larger style mugs and it would, be, it would have been great to put this on here, but I just felt that with a saucer and teacup set, it needs to be really well balanced. It needs to be dainty and sweet and the right curvature to sort of match each other so that they complement each other. You don't want like, I don't know, you want it to be like salt and pepper or like, German scones. I don't know, but you want them to complement each other so that they feel really nice together and they're really dainty. So I, that was a long explanation to say I didn't make a cup for this, um, which, but I, I just think it's really important. Um, but what I did decide to do was to turn this into something special. I thought, well, I've got this beautiful saucer that's a quite lovely dish shape. I could turn it into like maybe a little, um, a little water pot for a water dish for bees after our bee reveal and the bee that, um, was looking for water it's really nice and shallow in the middle there and I could attach some little bees but the, the weather wasn't on my side for the bee mold to set in time at the same time as the plate to attach them all um, so I decided that what I could do is turn this into a really gorgeous incense dish using some reveals um, from previous yeah some previous molds that we've done so I've done the duck and the strawberry which you'll see me paint to match up with this plate really delightfully um, so with the plate I had the full intention to sort of go in with a really simple, um, minimal <laughs> leaf detail around the rim, but me being kitschy and colorful, I ended up adding this really beautiful blue strip, um, in the center, uh, well, not in the center, in the middle rim. And then I added some daisies in there to sort of give it this ring around the rosy type feel, uh, because I wanted it to be like kind of florally, kind of kitschy, kind of springtime. And then I, I thought that the white flowers that I used, which you'll see me paint in a minute, um, complemented the strawberries as well because it sort of gives it like it's the strawberry flower so it was also sort of like complement each part and I really really loved painting this because I gave it sort of like a very symmetrical feel it's very like not symmetrical but it is at the same time like it has this really nice flow to it and it's just it's so delicate and I love it. The other thing I love about this saucer is it makes me excited because I have always wanted to interpret the Mad Hatter Tea Party and make my own set that looks like the Mad Hatter Tea Party. So that has made me excited that we've got a teapot, we've got a teacup, we've got a cake stand. I don't know. We've got lots of things. Anyway, we could always make that out of what we've got already as well, but I, I'm really excited. There's a lot of time-lapse footage in this reveal because I figured out how to use my time-lapse feature on my camera. Um, but I want to delve into this week's discussion of, well, discussion topic uh, of branding.
So what is branding? People talk about it all the time. I'm going to talk about how it sort of fits into the art world and how it's really important if you are looking at selling your work, if you're looking at turning your favorite art hobby into a business. Um, branding is a really crucial and key part of, I guess, how you present yourself and how you present your work online specifically and on your website and everything like that that helps you reach your ideal customer your ideal client to do the work that you want to create. So to unpack branding, branding is pretty much your values, your art voice, who you represent, what you aim to show in your work, what message you want to bring across and also who your ideal customer is. That is branding sort of in a really brief nutshell. Uh, is quite a large <laughs> area and it can be quite overwhelming because I feel like branding is kind of like that question in a job interview where they're like, so tell me about yourself. And it always makes you go, oh, I don't know. I don't know where to think about myself. I don't know why I'm here. It's kind of like the really, the tricky things to answer, but it's sort of really important to answer them before you start selling your work. The reason for that is you want to keep your branding consistent. You want to add value to your customer. You want to be reliable to your customer that is potentially buying your work um, and that's why branding is really important to establish at the start so that people understand who you are they connect with you straight away and they're more likely to buy your art because they understand where the art comes from turning your art into a business can sometimes be a little bit much because you're so used to working in your own ebb and flow that you're not really I guess like tailoring what you're doing to someone you're doing it based on your own emotion whereas when you turn it into a business sometimes that emotion needs to shift a little bit to opening that vulnerability up and showcasing what is in the artwork so that it connects with your customer and they understand where that work has developed and grown from the first part of sort of setting up your branding is to think about what your artist voice is. So your artist voice, it does not have to stay the same because as we make art, it comes from a place of inspiration, passion, resilience, strength, joy, all these emotions that flow through us to create the magic that we do. It can't really stay regimented based on, you know, a certain set of principles. But what you can do for branding your art business is think about what values do you have have as an artist what sort of voice do you want to have is it to spread joy is it to spread passion is it to be inspiring is it to show realism surrealism is it to show the best of both worlds of two different styles that haven't really been done before is it to make a commentary on politics feminism environmentalists um, it could be anything just think about what they are because it's kind of like you're in art school or you're back at high school doing a portfolio of your work and you're just sort of I guess like writing down what the main theme of what you're going to do is and that way it's a really good backbone to fall back on if you're doing social media you can sort of tailor what you share and you know what's good to share based on what your branding themes are so if something comes up that relates to your art you know that you can share it because it falls back into that key theme of that branding so that it connects with your ideal customer because they've come to you for that style or that uh, message or inspiration that you were sharing the next part of branding which a lot of people talk about is niche and niche feels like a really strange foreign word but the way I sort of understand niche is all the elements that make up your work creates your niche so you're not going to be the same as every other artist because you fit different check boxes that they don't fit so for example my work the niche that it falls into is it's pottery, that's the first one. It's colorful, illustrative, it's whimsical. That's the second one. The third one is with my typical work, it's based off Australiana and things that I'm inspired by. Everyone's inspirations are different, so they're gonna create vastly different work. Um, and so that's just three things that make my work unique to me. Whereas some other people might fit into the pottery checkbox. There might be a drawer out there that does really whimsical Australiana stuff, but because they don't fit into the pottery, they're niche 
niche is slightly different. So that's how you sort of figure out the niche. And the niche sort of helps in a way because I think with so many artists out there, you can start to get imposter syndrome. You can start to get doubt, like, is my work going to sell? Um, am, am I going to be good enough for this? There's so many other talented people out there. How am I going to sort of have someone that wants to buy my work the niche is sort of something that makes it a little bit less overwhelming because you can fit in, into your niche um, and you know that you're the only person that can offer exactly what you're doing and that makes you different and sets you apart from other artists which then in turn in a business mindset can connect to customers because you're offering something different compared to everyone else Think of your niche kind of like in a business mindset, the gap in the market that no one has met yet. And the key criteria of that is you. No, like you haven't done this yet and you haven't offered your beautiful skills and your beautiful ways of seeing the world in your art yet. And that makes it really important and something that someone will value and love and cherish. So just keep that in mind if you ever get imposter syndrome. I have sure had it before. Um, I get it sometimes now, but not as much as I used to because I've started to really value my skill and who I am and relied on my branding so much that I wouldn't get that imposter syndrome syndrome creeping on in. I'm just going to interrupt myself with a brief little um, explanation as to what imposter syndrome is because I keep mentioning it. It happens to a lot of artists. It pretty much means you feel like you're a fraud or you feel like you shouldn't be doing this or you're not good enough. It's pretty much like that little voice in the back of your head that tells you like to stop, but I'm telling you to not stop. Don't listen to the imposter syndrome. You are worthy. You are enough. You are valued. We want to see your work. Don't let the imposter syndrome beat you because you're amazing. Now that you understand, I guess, like what the branding is and what your niche is, you can start to connect with your community. You can start to post and be confident in what you're posting on social media, on your website, and you know that everything's going to align. The intention and the purpose of aligning your ethos, your values and everything with your art means that when your customer comes to you, they don't just come to you for your art, they come to you for the connection you have with the art and they can feel a connection with the art right back. They understand where it has come from, they understand the passion, the intent, the motivation, the pure joy, passion, love, time, effort, all of that, they understand that and they can connect with it, which makes them more likely to support you as a person, just as much as they love the art. The art will speak for itself, but with so much out in the world, this kind of sounds a bit doom and gloom, but with so much out in the world, it just adds this extra element for people to connect with you, understand who you are and feel the feelings that you had when you create the work. And that is... The, the thing that sets artist business apart from any other business is there is so much more love, passion, joy and care that goes into every single one that you want to portray that in your branding and your niche so that you can connect with your ideal customer and sell work and do your passion for a living. Branding works as a formula to give you confidence to know what to put in your captions, what to put on your website, how your words are going to align with your art so that it gets your message across in more ways than just the image of your work, which just the image of your work will be enough. Don't get me wrong. It's really beautiful, but it just adds an extra level of connection. And I keep repeating myself, but I, I, I just really want it to hit home that branding is really important, even as an art business. Um, and it can move with your art. It doesn't have to be rigid, but yeah, just think about it. If you're thinking about um, turning your art into a full-time job and also don't take my word for gospel because uh this is from my lived experience and it's totally different from yours and someone else's on the internet um do your research have a think about what that means for you um and yeah i just hope that it was helpful in some way okay let's get back to the mold reveal and the art and this final reveal of the reveal so you just saw me then glazing the pieces so because i've got the hole in them what i did to pour them up i held the hole with my thumb so that the glaze wouldn't um 
it wasn't a pain to like the glaze wouldn't drip out and it wasn't a pain to clean up post pouring the glaze in i then used a bit of cantha white in the duct to remove the glaze from the hole because we want that hole to be open for the incense to flow out of it i then dipped the plates into the glaze you can use tongs for this i just don't like tongs it's a personal preference don't come at me for that i just find that using my finger works so much better i don't have those little divots from um, the little tong tools and I just, what I do is that little half moon, moon, I just smooth it out on the plate, dab a little bit of um, extra glaze on there and it works perfectly fine. I like this method, I prefer it, but you don't have to and that's okay. We all do things differently, that's the beauty of art. So just dabbing that glaze on there. Once I have done that, I then dip the ducky and the strawberry into the glaze. Um, it was a little bit tricky to keep the hole free from glaze, but I just kept putting that cant the white in to make sure that the hole was completely free. Um, thankfully, I was able to get that all free from glaze in the kiln. I can share that now. I made sure to sponge down the bottoms of my pieces. I don't put my pieces on stilts in the kiln. You can put them in stilts if you like. Personal preference is I like to have an unglazed finish on the bottom. Um, I just like the feel of that on my work. You don't have to like that. You can do whatever you want. Um, I'm not going to come for you for any decision you make. And there's no judgment here because they all have their own pros and cons. So I pack them in the kiln and plates are a little bit tricky because you need to put them on the top shelf of the kiln. So I had to actually space the firings out over two glaze firings so I put them like in the center of the kiln I put them in overnight and I was just really hoping that they don't warp plates are absolute annoying little cherubs for <laughs> <laughs> for warping in the kiln um, and I haven't fired these plates before and I guess I'm pretty much setting up for what happened in the, the kiln overnight is the first kiln load of the plates I had a plate significantly warp um, I could see it straight away so what had happened is I think because I had it hanging off the shelf too far it sort of didn't have enough support so it sort of drooped and sort of come up i don't know i'll show you what it looks like in a gif but here's the other kiln opening so you can see so opening it up i was really reluctant because i was just praying that nothing had warped um, and that i had fixed the issues but upon opening it, um, there were warping issues again. So I need to sort of navigate that and figure out whether it's a mold issue, a shape issue, a placement issue. I'm not sure just yet. I'm going to have to play with that. Um, it does seem weird that I've done plates before and they haven't warped. So I just wonder whether it's the shape. Maybe it's a bit base heavy. Uh, maybe it needs to be poured thinner in the base so that it holds its shape a bit better. But you can see it's quite a wave. Um, thankfully, with these pieces, Pieces. they are incense dish pieces I'm not really sure it's really tricky because this is definitely a seconds if I was selling a dinnerware set um, because you want the stackable appeal of your plates you want to be able to put them away nicely but because this is for a display incense dish I'm not really sure where it fits because you kind of it's kind of got a quirk and an element of um, yeah whimsy to it anyway so I'm gonna have to think about that one I think it will be will be discounted regardless just because of that um, issue in the kiln of the warping but otherwise it looks really cute with the strawberry on top the white flowers definitely look like strawberry flowers and then the ducky it all balances well so this ducky I added a little bit of blue to complement the blue in the ring and I really like it. I wish I added the blue to all of them. I only did it to the one. But here is a little look at the warping. Let's just get the warping out of the way. So you can see this one's quite waved, but when you stack them together, this is what I mean by it just looking like a um, appropriate non-swear word. <laughs> I just they just look horrible when they're stacked they're they're just like all, all over the place <laughs> they don't know which way they want to go so um whether that's because I tried to squeeze them in maybe I should have just done one each firing it just feels like such a waste of space in my little kiln though doing one plate of firing but it, they're just all over the shop <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're gorgeous they look beautiful they just don't stack there should be an even gap between each rim um all the way around and that's a really good stackable plate but 
Oh well, you learn things. <laughs> if not learning, what is it for? Um, so let's talk about the good now that we got that warping out of the way. I need to test these for incense. So I made, I was really worried about these because I didn't test them before completely firing them. And the reason for that is because I could not find incense cones in lockdown. I could not find them. I found them on the very last, at the very last minute. So I'm testing them as finished results. Um, rookie mistake. I was thinking about them during the week when they were going through the kiln, got thinking, oh, I should have put maybe like like some ventilation on underneath so that the air can flow underneath and then push the smoke out and it's not fighting for oxygen through the the hole um, but now I'll be the tester I got two different types of incense cones in case one works better but I didn't notice any different I just thought I'd show you that a jumbo cone and a mini cone work just as good I found that the strawberry worked really well with the smaller cones and look how beautiful that smoke is like coming out of the mouth it's so beautiful it was actually really mesmerizing watching my creation like turn into this relaxing beautiful uh burning sensation I don't know what to call burning sensation I don't know what I'm saying I've tried to say that I, I really liked watching this and it was really relaxing and I shot so much footage and I only included so much of it but I was really in love with how these finished and I am really proud of these despite the warping I think that these are so gorgeous and unlike any incense dish I've ever seen um, and something that I am going to love to use um, I will put some of these up for sale in my restock but yeah I'm really I'm really proud of these they're my first incense dish so I think that they're really beautiful and I can't wait to revisit this saucer when we find a teacup in the mold reveals hopefully like there has to be a teacup I am counting on it anyway let me know what you think about this reveal and what I did with it given we don't have a teacup yet let me know below in the comments and make sure you to do your thing like subscribe follow click as many buttons as you can because they help support me to keep doing these reveals but here is your sneak peek for next week's reveal part 44.